Session two: Life after association. In search of a greater purpose. Moderator: Stephen Blockmans, senior research fellow and head of EU Foreign Policy Unit at the Center for European Policy Studies. Speakers: David Zalkaliani, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia; Peter Siarto, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary; Pavel Fischer. Chairman of the Foreign Affairs, Defense, and Security Committee of the Senate of the Czech Republic, Jardanka Joksimovic, Minister of European Integration of the Republic of Serbia, Aldun Alversen, State Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Norway. My name is Stephen Blockmans. I'm the, the head of the EU Foreign Policy Unit at uh, SEPS, and I should declare color in this uh, context. Um, we at SEPS have been, uh, together with colleagues in the room, have been uh, developing our studies on the association agreement and DCFTA with Georgia and the other Eastern Partnership countries for some time now in its practical implementation. And we've also explored possibilities as to what should be the next steps for Georgia and the other Eastern Partnership countries in getting closer to the European Union in search of a greater purpose, the, 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 the subtitle of this, of this panel. In a way, this, this panel is supposed to be a sort of thought experiment. I think it is fair to say that on the one hand, in the um, referring to the initial documents of 2009 of the Eastern Partnership itself says that the Eastern Partnership is developed without prejudice to individual partner countries' aspirations for their future relations with the European Union. It's already been acknowledged by the previous uh, panel that 10 years on, uh, the Eastern Partnership is considered by many as an important branch of EU foreign policy but that it suffers from some shortcomings. Um, one notably is, of course, the EU's uh, failure to grant its associated partners a membership perspective, an EU membership perspective, which is said to mitigate uh, some of the positive impact of uh, policies, um, and its own policy, uh, rather. Um, and moreover, um, the fact that uh, the, uh, the EU has been uh, quite elusive about the finalité of the Eastern Partnership um, has, um, has of course also um, eluded some of the, the, the strengthening of the uh, relations with those, uh, with those countries and perhaps um, the, EAP's, the EAP's aim of, uh, of strengthening resilience within those six countries, institutions and society remains as a result suspended in animation. Um, there have been, uh, of course, different uh, avenues already explored in strengthening those relationships. And the EU has, on, within the Eastern Partnership framework, but also in a bilateral context, developed innovative ways in order to give more body to uh, a strengthened partnership. And Georgia is uh, not the least of those countries uh, with which experiments have been made. Georgia is the only country not just the only Eastern Partnership country, but the only third country which benefits from a direct interlocutor of its government with the College of the European Commission. And so maybe that's a, a way of further exploring that um, uh, as, as a potential avenue um, also for, for other countries. But I would like to, to turn to um, the, uh, the panelists here and, and first um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia itself, you've asked us to be bold in our statements uh, and very clear in our ideas, so I, I throw the ball straight back at you. Does it not go too far um, when we hear presentation after presentation this morning where Georgian politicians ask for a clear membership perspective of the European Union? Can you manage those expectations? Thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, I've asked in my introductory remarks for bold statements and to engage into lively discussion about the future and perspective of Eastern Partnership. Uh, in fact, um, uh, before answering your question, I would like to a little bit elaborate and to go back 
10 years ago when this uh, project was uh, established. And uh, from the very inception of the INSTER partnership um, initiative 10 years ago, we hear different uh, discussions about uh, what Eastern partnership is and what it is not. Uh, we hear from uh, different uh, uh, EU officials that uh, this project is not about uh, geopolitical competition, that this is not about, uh, um, it's not directed against anyone else. Uh, we also hear that uh, Eastern partnership is not um, the project which is imposing foreign policy choice, uh, the choice to uh, um, Eastern uh, Partnership uh, member states uh, and uh, that it's not creating dividing lines. And certainly what we hear is that Eastern Partnership is not a membership framework. Uh, all of, uh, of the above may be true uh, depending uh, on one's perspective. But I think uh, now we have to uh, discuss and uh, analyze uh, uh, and uh, to evaluate what was achieved during the uh, last 10 years and uh, what, what are the way uh, forward, uh, to what is our next goal, what is our next step. Uh, with the uh, perspective of uh, 10 years, we can confidently say that Eastern Partnership was bold and uh, visionary a political initiative. Uh, in fact, it brought uh, together six uh, Eastern Partnership countries together with the uh, European Union uh, in accordance to their individual uh, preferences, uh, their ambitions, their different goals. Um, but uh, on the example of Georgia, I can say that Currently, Georgia is absolutely different than it was 10 years ago. And uh, Eastern Partnership definitely helped us to transform country and to modernize country. And uh, if you compare what was 10 years ago, it was Georgia, which was uh, even outside of the EU neighborhood. Now Georgia is the uh, uh, strongest and closest strategic partner with the uh, European Union. Georgia is a country which has signed association agreement, country which has a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, which is a member of the energy community. We have uh, special and unique formats established, especially for Georgia, like security dialogue, as well as uh, um, high-level di dialogue with the EU Commission. And definitely I can conclude that uh, uh, the Easter Partnership is not about uh, creating new dividing lines. It's a, a project which extends the zone of stability in our volatile region. And the Easter Partnership definitely helps us to establish a zone of prosperity and security here. Uh, of course, the uh, Easter Partnership is not about membership, and we realize this. Uh, it's a rather uh, project of Georgia's gradual economic integration and political association with Europe. Um, as I have mentioned, we have remarkable achievements, but this is not our final goal. Uh, our final goal is already declared. This is uh, eventual goal is uh, full integration and the membership into European Union. But we also realize the current situation within European Union, the current challenges EU is facing related to migration problems, related to the discussions on budgetary issues. Everything is, this is not creating the good ground for um, talks about expansion, but despite this, we are not discouraged. We are continuing our uh, reform agenda. We are developing our strategy, how to prepare country functionally, and recently tabled, tabled uh, for the consideration of our European partners uh, the roadmap to Europe, which is our concept paper, uh, where, where we are describing how to um, um, uh, go closer in, uh, with the European Union in sectoral cooperation, physical integration in energy, transport, uh, trade, as well as uh, um, to ensure more integrational processes within 
different uh, European programs and agencies. So this is our vision, how we see to continue how to prepare country functionally in order to be ready for the momentum when Europe is ready and then Georgia is ready. So this is how, how we see from the 10 years perspective the current situation and the way forward. Thank you. Also for, uh, and we'll come back to those points, especially those functional steps of association and further integration into the wider European family. Uh, but I want to press you on, on that point on um, the, the finalité, the end goal, EU membership. You mentioned uh, realities on the EU side, but what if, what if we turn again to the wider geopolitical spectrum? Shouldn't you be careful what you wish for? Or, part of uh, Georgian territory is occupied by Russian forces already. Can you man manage also the, ex well, uh, the expectations in, in the Kremlin? Should you be ready and how do you prepare for that? Yes, of course, uh, we realize that the current challenges we are facing, especially security challenges, um, more than 20% of Georgian territories are, occup are occupied. Uh, even more, the process of factual annexation uh, is going on and its uh, continued occupation is going on. Uh, people on the ground are really suffering on a daily basis. We are facing the effects of violation of fundamental human rights. Uh, ethnic Georgians who have sporadically returned back to their permanent places of residence, they are um, ethnically discriminated. And, uh, but our policy is the only, it has no alternative, only peaceful settlement. We are consistent to the peaceful settlement of conflict. We are very actively engaged in the different formats like the Geneva International Discussions, which is the, which is the main format where we are talking with the Russian Federation in, with the presence of um, uh, big actors like European Union, OSCE, UN, United States. So uh, uh, to, today in the morning, President mentioned how, uh, the, the, how to make Geneva uh, process more effective and more efficient. So we are thinking about this. Of course, it's no, we are not uh, satisfied with the results of Geneva. Until now, we had a 48 or 49 rounds of Geneva talks without concrete, tangible results. But uh, this is the only process. We only instrument in our hands. We have this uh, consolidation of support of international community. We are constantly raising high in uh, the international community's agenda, in the agenda of our partners with the Russian Federation, unacceptability of continued occupation and annexation of Georgian territory. We are consistent with, us with our for, for the, the peaceful settlement of conflict. Georgia has taken legally binding pledge not to use force for restoring our territorial integrity. And I think by, by this policy, we are trying to minimize risks and challenges coming from outside. It's really necessary, it's really important for stability. We have to ensure stability in the country. Without stability, there is no development, there is no prosperity. And here again, we be, we, I said that the uh, partnership is not a membership process. Of course, our eventual goal is membership, but the process itself is really very helpful and very useful for strengthening country internally for strengthening Georgia's state institutions, for building vibrant democratic society, country where human rights are respected, where national minority rights are respected, and thus make this country attractive for people living on the other side of occupation line. So this is the policy how we, we see our future and how to make Georgia's Europeanization process irreversible. So new peace initiative, which was recently tabled for consideration, step to better future, it considers all the benefits Georgia is getting from the process of EU integration. We want to share these benefits to people living on the other side. Benefits we are getting from trade, free trade agreement with European yep. Union, freedom of movement, mobility, education, etc., etc. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, um, there was a reference, of course, to uh, the enlargement process, uh, Ms. Yokozimovic. Uh, but before Serbia was granted candidate country status, and before, of course, it started negotiating um, enlargement or accession to the European Union, it was a part of the stabilization and association process, quite unique, of course, in the Western Balkan context. But nevertheless, the association that 
was present there. What, what did it mean for Serbia's preparation uh, on the way to the European Union? Thank you for your question and uh, for my distinguished colleagues and uh, audience. I want, first of all, to express that I'm a little bit dissatisfied with the fact that our colleagues from first panel, from ministers from different EU member states, have not been here to listen uh, us from different, uh, I would say, stages of accession, association, and other forms of, let's say, um, linkage with the European Union, because I think it would be excellent for them to hear our own opinions about the process. So that is the first remark I wanted to say, but okay, I, I'm sure that it was not malintention. So, uh, the, the second thing is that uh, you mentioned Western Balkan. Uh, I think that, first of all, we should also uh, redefine and try to, uh, to, to establish or to make some um, uh, rethinking exercise uh, to see how uh, to change lexical, uh, lexical uh, I would say, patterns in European Union. So you say Western Balkan. What does it mean? Where is the Northern Balkan? Where is the Eastern Balkan or the Southern one? I suppose they are members of European Union today. So uh, it's the same with the neighborhood policy. Because, for example, you have specific department in European Union dealing with enlargement and neighborhood policy. So the question is, uh, is it enlargement part of foreign policy of European Union? Or it should be, or it is still, part of internal common or joint European policy which should strengthen or re-strengthen or re-energize the European Union as a global actor. Because it's unpresidential um, advantage of European Union to have these contractual agreements with the states that they want to become and to share the values set, set by uh, European Union, uh, let's say, uh, democracies. So uh, I think the question is the same for the neighborhood policy. Is it a neighborhood policy a part of uh, only European external action service, or it is a part of, of a real, uh, let's say, re-energized European Union as a global actor? Because we heard at the first panel how it's important for European Union to uh, be competitive uh, on, the, I would say, very... Uh, in, in, the frame, in the framework of stark realities that we are now facing. And we should not dwell anymore on yesterday's myths and rosy imaginations. Uh, maybe it's, however, they are still very cozy, but uh, I think that we have no, new realities. So when it comes to the enlargement politics, Serbia is a candidate country. We have opened 17 chapters out of 35 chapters, so almost a half of chapters that we have opened. We, are we started officially negotiations in 2014, but before that, almost 10 years, we were preparing for first SAA agreement that we have signed in 2008 and 9. And uh, so 10 years ago. So I, uh, only, only I can hope that um, we will not celebrate uh, 10 or 15 years of negotiation process because I've heard this morning that we are celebrating 10 years of partnership. I hope that we will not celebrate, I don't know, 15 or 20 years of negotiations. Because the internal logic of the process is membership. You know, sometimes people ask me, because I'm a minister for five years in Serbia for EU integration, and they ask me, okay, so minister, why we are in this process? Because we can reach different standards without being a, a you know, candidate country, fulfilling all difficult obligations that you have to fulfill. And then everybody will say, yes, it's good for your society. Of course it is. This is self-understandable. But the added value of the process and the internal logic as a driving force for this process is a full membership. Sorry to interrupt, but of course, President uh, of the Commission, Juncker, has said that, you know, 2025 would be the earliest possible date where frontrunners in the accession process might join. Others have immediately negated that uh, as, you know, fantasy. Um, but to your point, is the absence of a clear time path on the accession process, does that risk basically undermining the progress of democratization and modernization that is being achieved? 
Well, uh, actually, uh, you mentioned something very important that we always forget, that uh, last year, it was February 2018, European Commission uh, created so-called credible enlargement strategy for Western Balkans mainly, uh, and uh, Serbia and Montenegro has been marked as the front runners of this process with the open possibility to uh, become a member state till 2025. So it is mentioned in European Commission document. Of course, we never said this is a promise. We said this is open opportunity if we deliver our own obligations and uh, uh, if EU delivers their own obligations. What does it mean? The key, I would say the key word is credibility. That is why this strategy has been uh, titled as credible strategy. What does it mean? It means that uh, if we deliver on our obligations, European Union will give us better status, I mean, better, uh, or let's say, uh, more steps forward to European membership. So, just to explain to, uh, to you what happened, for example, just a month ago, if Serbia did not open one chapter in June this year, enlargement politics will be uh, clinically dead of Western Balkan. Because no one else did a single step forward in EU accession process, because we are talking, when it comes to Western Balkan, about accession process. It's a little bit different from the association process that Eastern Partnership is framed to. So, uh, we have opened one chapter. Without that, no single partner from Western Balkan will make, uh, uh, actually, uh, no one made any single step. So that's why I think it's crucial and important, as you said, to keep um, European integration as a credible perspective, as a driver for domestic reforms, because it's a question sometimes of laziness and uh, uh, inertia in societies, especially, let's say, pr post-transitional societies. So we need to speed up these reforms. We need some frame to, to, push, up, to push us a little bit to be more um, uh, eager and uh, to, to deliver more. But generally, uh, I can say that Serbia today, with all... Uh, especially fiscal consolidation measures, uh, improvements in, uh, let's say, the area of rule of law, a lot of things that we, uh, we, we did in recent past really um, became a good proof that this process has its own um, benefit for the society and that we are really now a, one of the front runner of this process. That's why I just want to mention that we will sign tomorrow, my colleague um, and, uh, and myself, we will sign the agreement for, from, uh, with <coughs> Serbia and Georgia to exchange experience and we want to give our own experience to Georgia to help Georgia to be as much as it's, it's possible to be successful in this process. Okay, that's an uh, interesting um, interesting new development. Thank you for sharing that. I want to uh, maybe evoking um, Ministers Wallström's provisual, uh, proverbial rather ladder towards the European Union um, from the current association agreement um, with next steps towards ultimate EU membership and, and turn to Mr. Halvorsson um, who of course hails from uh, Norway, a country that is the biggest member of the Euro uh, European economic area, um, a highly integrated uh, form of, um, of an organization of which its members nevertheless remain outside of the European Union. What are the, the benefits and the shortfalls or the shortcomings of such membership? Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you um, for, for being here at, at the conference and, and also uh, the pleasure of attending this, this panel. I will return to the question of your question, Stephen. I would just like to say a few words initially on the Norwegian engagement in the Eastern Partnership and the experience of the EEA uh, as an EEA country that could perhaps also be of, of interest to, to the um, uh, Eastern Partnership countries. And of course, uh, Norway is formally an outsider in both uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, and also in the EU as such. But of course, uh, I think it's safe to say that we are the most uh, integrated uh, non-member country. Uh, and of course, 
That is mostly through the EA agreement, but also with more than 70 other uh, agreements between Norway and the EU. So that means that for 25 years, we have the experience of working very closely uh, towards the EU, with the EU, and also within the EU, uh, while being formally on the outside, which uh, I think is a relevant, a relevant experience also for uh, associated and partner countries. And that means that also when it comes to foreign policy, we see that the Norwegian, uh, Norway and the EU share policies and priorities, not the least to the neighborhood, which has informed our work uh, through the Eastern Partnership framework from the very outset. This has been a key priority for us. We share the goals of the Eastern Partnership. We work uh, very closely with the EU when it comes to the priorities, when it comes to the policies. Uh, we supplement and we coordinate it very well. Uh, we actually now have a more than 40 million euro annual budget line for our cooperation with uh, the EAP countries. There are also direct contributions to uh, Eastern Partnership projects. Uh, a recent example is a new project with uh, Estonia, working on uh, transparent local government here in Georgia and in other EAP countries. And also the uh, Norway and EEA a regional fund where uh, some partnership countries can work with third uh, with um, EU partners in uh, in, in building um, partnerships. But moving on to the uh, EEA perspective and experience, the EEA agreement celebrates its 25th anniversary this year. This year, we see that popular support for the agreement in the member or in the EEA countries remain strong. The agreement continues to serve us well. And of course, Norway and the other EEA members are now fully integrated in the single market. The four freedoms apply fully. The trade aspect is hugely important. For Norway, uh, the EU receives uh, about 80% of our exports. But it is, of course, much broader. It goes to movement, it goes to education, it goes to uh, businesses, investments. Uh, consumer protection and uh, very important mutual uh, policies such as combating climate change. So the value is obvious. But at the same time, and this I think is a key point, there is still a discussion even in, within this mature framework of the EEA on how to best work uh, within the framework. We see that it requires substantial institutional capacity and continuity, more or less to the same uh, level required as in member countries. And it also requires continued political will. So even for EEA countries, it can be institutionally and politically challenging to capitalize on the possibilities that the framework for cooperation with the EU entails. You have to seize the opportunities, you have to stay relevant, you have to prove your relevance uh, and how uh, participation and contribution to specific initiatives will serve the common good, so to say. I think this is a crucial part of building credibility, uh, which at the end of the day is the decisive factor for association and beyond. So, when it comes to the question of the EA today, uh, I would say that the benefits are obvious. Uh, for uh, Norway, it provides uh, full access to the European market, uh, participation in uh, programs, uh, full application of the four freedoms. Uh, it has provided the basis also for many of our other points of co uh, cooperation with the EU, such as uh, participation in, in Schengen. So for Norway, it works very well, given that there is no political uh, will in the Norwegian population for full membership. And I think that is also the situation also in Iceland and, and Liechtenstein. But of course, looking at the EEA today, it is, it is a child of its times. This was uh, established in the early 1990s uh, you know, in a certain set of political conditions with a certain set of actors, being you know, the EU at the time and the EFTA countries at the time. And of course, in that perspective, the relevance today can be discussed. Uh, perhaps it could be argued that it is more relevant to discuss tailor-made uh, solutions for today's political uh, conditions and, politic or, and the actors involved, where of course the 
EA, the uh, Eastern Partnership countries, is a rather different uh, set of actors than the EFTA countries from the early 90s. Uh, let me see if I can tease you a little bit and, uh, and get something more out of it behind you know, the diplomatic formulations that you so carefully um, weave. Um, the EEA and EA membership is essentially achieved through two ways, two tracks. Either through EU membership track, which is off limits as of yet for Eastern partnership countries, or by becoming, as you alluded to, a member of EFTA, the European Free Trade uh, Association, um, and Switzerland, of course, the only EFTA country that does not belong to, uh, to the EA. Now, um, the last, in fact, accession to the EEA from a non-EU member state has been Liechtenstein in 1991. Since then, no further enlargement. How realistic, when sitting in Oslo, is it um, for your government, for your parliament, to accept any future accession application, membership application of, um, of an Eastern Partnership country to the EEA? How economically uh, and politically do you think um, advanced our uh, Eastern Partnership countries and Georgia in, in particular? <coughs> well, as you say, I think you know, right now it, the question is more or less hypothet hypothetical given the formalities of either uh, EFTA or the EU uh, sort of point of access. Uh, the uh, EFTA 4 re quite recently concluded a free trade agreement with Georgia. I think that was a very positive step forward. Uh, we would like to see that being used to its full uh, potential as a, as a sort of next step. And of course, you, many of the same political realities as you mentioned in your introduction, Stephen, when it comes to uh, sort of the, the situation on the EU side, that discussion w is also very much present in the uh, EEA EFTA capitals. Now, this would be something that would be, have to be very carefully considered uh, and also, I think, would be a, a quite controversial discussion. But looking at, you know, would the EEA today be the optimal solution for Eastern Partnership countries? I'm not sure that's a given either. If you look at the specificities of the EEA agreement as it is today, uh, if you look at the preconditions for access and for actually living up to the provisions of the EA agreement, you see that the, the demands when it comes to uh, adopting and implementing uh, EU legislation, when it comes to, uh, as I said, uh, the institutional capacity, uh, it is basically the same. So, you know, it's not necessarily uh, easier to, to enter the single market through the uh, EEA mechanism than through EU membership. Uh, and also looking at uh, economic issues, uh, specific sectoral uh, limitations on the EEA agreement. You know, there are items there that does not make this you know, necessarily very straightforward. No, I understand. And so in a way we're defining a sort of upper um, upper ceiling in a way in realistic terms, politically, economically, um, for those intermediate steps that could be taken uh, from the current status of association. Um, but nevertheless, the European Union is changing uh, too. Um, Minister uh, Siarto, um, what does it mean to be, um, uh, to be a member of the European Union today? And where do you, s what future membership, what, no, sorry, let me rephrase that. What do you think membership will look like in the future? Well, David, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you for moderating um, this panel. You know, Hungary belongs to the pro-enlargement countries in the European Union. But I have to be honest with you, this position, I mean, being pro-enlargement, is currently in minority within the European Union. We have to be honest towards each other. It, this position is currently in minority. Uh, we, Central Europeans, basically, are in favor of enlargement. We are in favor of quick uh, enlargement. Um, to be honest, I think that was a shame that three weeks ago the General Affairs Council has not made a decision to invite Albania and North Macedonia to, um, to start the accession talks. 
We always hear our Western European friends speaking very pathetically about the support towards um, enlargement policy. But when there is a real opportunity to decide, then the decision is always postponed. Now it is being said that the decision will be made in October. But it has been said for months that the decision would be done now. And the decision was not done. This is, I think, totally against the interest of the European Union and totally against the interest of the Central European countries, for sure. When we come together, foreign ministers of the European Union, once every month, like next Monday, and we address the situation of the so-called Western Balkans, which I usually like to refer to as a southern part of Central Europe, uh, there usually uh, many of the foreign ministers uh, complain that uh, big uh, factors or big actors of uh, global politics like Russia, China, Turkey, Qatar, whoever, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, are playing such an influential role in the Western Balkans. What a bad news that is. And then I raise the question to my colleagues, so my dear friends, why we are not playing that role? What hinders us from playing this role? What hinders us from making the decision that finally we start real accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia and we go forward with the accession process of Serbia and uh, Montenegro? I have to tell you that uh, you have uh, referred to, uh, uh, Stephen, to the, um, to the announcement of Jean-Claude Juncker, um, the outgoing president of the European Commission, suggesting that 2025 would be the first possible date for accession. I think it's unacceptable. We reject it. Because the time he made this uh, announcement was uh, 200, uh, sorry, 2,500 days away from 2025. 2,500 days. My question is, why do we need 2,500 days to make a decision whether Serbia, Montenegro, country, which we know very well, since we are neighboring countries, so we know, very, we know them very well, so why do we need 2,500 days to make a decision whether they are able to join the European Union or not? So this uh, position of the European Commission is unacceptable for us and we consider the decision of not launching accession talks uh, with, uh, with the further countries from the southern part of Central Europe as, as uh, something against the, um, the European interest. Look, the European Union, as you say, we are undergoing changes. I would phrase that we are faced with historic challenges because if you put forward Brexit, you put forward migration, increasing threat of terror, energy security, our relationship to the, um, to the Eurasian uh, Economic Union. So all these are putting uh, historic challenges ahead of us. And the question is how we uh, face them. And you know there are many complaints that there are debates. My question is why shouldn't be debates? Or when should be debates if not now when we are, when we are faced with real questions? And if you, uh, you look for real answers for real questions, definitely you do have debates. And challenging the right to debate is a very anti-democratic approach. So I think it's not bad news that we do have uh, debates within the, uh, within the European Union. But I, what is really bad news, that these challenges divert our attention from, uh, from these long-term strategic issues like enlargement. Because, Stephen, it's not going to be the most uh, sophisticated sentence you ever heard someone who is dealing with foreign affairs. But my principal position is that the more we are, the stronger we are. And you know, now, as UK is, um, is about to leave the European Union, this is going to be the first time ever that the number of the member states of the European Union will decrease. That has never happened in the past. Whenever there was a change regarding the number of the member states, there was an increase. And now there's going to be a decrease. And we would like to change this trend. We want to divert that. And we want the, um, the countries from the southern part of uh, Central Europe to, um, uh, to uh, join the European Union. And when it comes to the Eastern Partnership, you know, I think it's very discouraging that the only thing what we can say about the Eastern Partnership is that it's 10 years old. You know, I mean, uh, I think we, we, we need to get rid of this uh, one-size-fits-all approach and we should enter into a tailor-made um, tailor uh, approach period. Because definitely the six countries taking part in this pro program, project, or, or partnership, are coming from six different starting points and have six total different aspirations. Why do we want to stick them artificially? Why don't we apply a, a tailor-made approach um, uh, in this regard? And you know, when it comes to Eastern partnership, my big concern is, my big concern is that if we do not give, and this goes to the Western Balkans as well, if we do not give, as a European Union, if we do not give positive feedback to these countries, 
then the pro-European governments will suffer because their credibility will be harmed, because the people from your countries will ask the pro-European government, so why you are putting so many efforts on this pro-European or pro-NATO, pro-Euro-Atlantic path, if you don't get any kind of positive feedback? So not giving positive feedback from the, uh, from the, from on behalf of European Union, it is a bad strategy. So that's why I would like to tell you that we as a Central European country, we as a so-called newcomer, you know, <laughs> more than one and a half decades ago we joined. So uh, we as, uh, as so-called newcomers, we are more sensitive on enlargement, being neighborhood to the Western Balkans, being only two hours and 10 minutes flight away from Batumi, uh, we are more sensitive on that and we are pushing forward both Eastern Partnership Program to be more tangible and uh, the, um, the enlargement process to happen finally. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh... Credibility of the enlargement process, of course, hinges in cons consistent application. Um, and your, your adversaries would also agree with you, of course, that the enlargement process needs to be beefed up uh, in order to prepare candidate countries for, you know, uh, rule of law functioning. And we've seen that uh, before uh, in, in the discussion, at least, that, uh, that we had. My question is, and your, your own government is under the spotlight, of course, of the European Commission, uh, European Court of Justice. There is a de facto, but also a legal differentiation within the European Union in terms of membership of different uh, policy areas, uh, Schengen, uh, EMU, of course, Eurozone, uh, Defence uh, to a more limited extent, um, EPO, the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Um, so, hence my question again, how do you see the future of membership evolving? I mean, this is not going to just yeah. be the more the merrier. Yeah. Thank you for the bonus question. When uh, the expression rule of law is being said, that I know it's going to be a reference to Hungary or sometimes Poland, but it only depends on who is present. Um, so, um, you know, there's a big debate how we make European Union strong again. And this is the answer to your question. What will it mean to be a member of the European Union in the future? Because the two major approaches which are now in collision regarding the future of EU, one would say that EU can be made strong through strong Brussels, which would necessarily mean weaker member states. We think it's, uh, it's dead end street. Our, our, our uh, uh, concept is to make European Union stronger through strong member states. So for us, strong EU means strong member states. Member states which are competitive. Member states which are allowed to compete with each other. Member states which are not uh, pushed to uh, communize debt. Member states which are not uh, pushed to uh, harmonize taxes. Member states which are not pushed to get rid of national identity. Member states which can easily be proud and of and stick to national, religious, um, historic and cultural heritage. So for us, a strong European Union means strong member states. On the other hand, what you mentioned with a good reason, Stephen, and I totally agree with you, that when we speak about whether EU is going to be multi-speed or single speed, it's already decided. It's a multi-speed union. Why? Because there are countries which are members of the Schengen area and which are not members of the Schengen area. There are countries which are uh, applying euro and countries which, which are not uh, applying uh, euro. Countries which are uh, uh, within CFSP and countries which are a little bit further away from the common foreign and security policy. So I think that the, that the essence of your question can be answered what will it mean to be a member of European Union if this debate is going to be decided which way European Union is going to go. It's going to be a United States of Europe, which we totally reject, or it's going to be an alliance of strong nations. This, this is what we uh, do support. And if th this uh, debate is going to be decided upon, then it's going to be possible to answer your question what it will mean in the future to be a member of European Union. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fisher, you've been very patient, as indeed has our audience, and I do want to uh, give time also to you to, to intervene you know, from the floor with questions and, and observations that you may have. Uh, we'll, we will have time until uh, to 10 past 1 at least uh, to, before we wrap up this uh, session. Um, th the functioning of the European Union, Mr. Fisher, is of course also premised on a level of trust, um, which is you know, trust between member states, uh, so as to operate a single market uh, with its uh, extensions, as we have already heard. Um, and a level of solidarity, of course, between uh, member state governments. We've seen in the crisis years um, that, uh, that hopefully lie behind us to a great extent that there's been an erosion in trust and solidarity, usually 
rules and institutions can help in building that trust and solidarity. Um, what do you think, uh, from your perspective, from the Czech uh, Senate uh, and your previous career as a politician, um, is does it mean to be a, a member state at the moment and what do you think might be the future uh, for membership? Thank you very much for inviting me to today in Batumi. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to speak not only on my own quality but uh, in my own capacity, but also to speak on behalf of the Senate, because in the Senate, Georgia, namely, has many very, very good friends. And uh, we discuss very often how to promote and help and speed up the process. Two questions, solidarity and trust. Solidarity first. I am of the opinion that the recent issue which was discussed within the Council of Europe regarding the opening door to Russian Federation after the invasion of Ukraine without further conditions was a grave mistake. Because many of the countries, first Ukraine, but Georgia and others, were against this decision. And I think that part of the solidarity we have to stick to is that as member states of European Union, we should act together uh, in fora which are promoting values and, and a rule of law. And this is Council of Europe. So we didn't deliver at that time. We, Czech Republic, European Union, because Georgia and Ukraine were of another opinion. Inviting back Russia after invading Ukraine was a mistake because there were not any further conditions for it. Second, trust. Those who trust each other had, has to have, a, uh, have to commit to a very trustful speech and not to hide things. So I think that first thing is that we have to admit that within EU, uh, European Union and uh, European member states and structures, we are not ready for this, for instance, enlargement uh, with uh, uh, Georgia. At the same time, we have to commit and we have to do maybe more. We have to put something more on the table. This more should be, for instance, budget committed to different projects. We should maybe do more in terms of inviting Georgia to take part in different sectorial um, uh, cooperations. We should maybe create a clearing house where Georgia should come and ask for help and individual member states, member countries should uh, uh, propose uh, how to react, how to fulfill this need, how to meet the needs on behalf of Georgia and how to meet the proposals of, on behalf of member states. So if we speak about trust, we have to be very clear that the gap between the expectation we have uh, seen to, today and the bold messages on behalf of Madam uh, President of the Republic, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, it was such a sound message that we have to say, thank you very much, we listen, and we are ready to take this commitment very seriously, but at the same time, let's create a space that would provide to Georgia, namely, but also to other countries, space to move forward without uh, opening this um, negotiation process for which we are not simply ready. And on the national level, and now I speak uh, on behalf of the House, of the Senate, we are ready and we do already accompanying uh, a Georgian aspiration in this regard. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fischer, especially also for squaring the circle and coming back to, to Georgian's aspirations. I'm looking into the room. Um, we still have... Um, around 12 to 14 minutes to, uh, for questions and answers. Uh, so I would like you, first, those of you who want to ask questions to be short 
and sweet to ask a question and to briefly also uh, mention your name, affiliation, and to whom you would like to address the question. See a gentleman there on the side. You can start. If a microphone could make its way. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is, I'm here. My name is Georgi Gandelaki, and I am an MP with the, with the parliamentary opposition, European Georgia Party. Uh, obviously, no such discussion is complete without Ukraine and the Ukrainian question. And I would be most curious uh, to hear views of panelists, uh, where do they want Ukraine to go uh, in one year's time, let's say so. And I have a very concrete question to the Georgian foreign minister. Uh, Dear Minister, how can you explain that for seven years no Prime Minister of Georgia has visited Ukraine in bilateral format? Uh, many critics of yours, including myself, view this fact as a sign of erosion of the Georgian foreign policy. And could you also share with us whether Prime Minister of Georgia has plans to visit Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you very much. The Ukraine question is, is key, of course, if we define next steps for Georgia on its way to the European Union, the immediate question will be, well, what about Ukraine? Minister. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this question. Of course, uh, Ukraine is uh, Georgia's closest uh, partner, strategic partner. We are developing very close bilateral times in bilateral formal as well as multilateral formats within Guam group, uh, within Eastern Partnership. And we, of course, uh, considering being together with uh, Ukraine in many new formats like TRIO format, for example, on DCFTA. And also when we are thinking about uh, how to uh, proceed further uh, within the Eastern Partnership group on the uh, EU integration pro process, I think this format of Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine to focus on the uh, DCFTA and trade related issues as well as cooperation across the Black Sea to increase that uh, transport communication is a, a good example. I cannot agree the, with uh, the colleague from the parliament that uh, there was no uh, bilateral meetings with the Prime Minister of Georgia with, uh, 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 first of all, the President was here, the President and also Prime Minister was here in Georgia and there was a meeting between them and we are constantly using also uh, the uh, different formats, different uh, gatherings of um, into, during the, in the margins of international organization, general assembly format as well uh, as the Munich Security Conference, etc., where we are meeting and constantly di discussing. I have direct contact with my Ukrainian colleague just before Batumi conference, I talked with him personally and I invite him uh, to, to participate here. We have Deputy Vice uh, Prime Minister here and uh, the, the Deputy uh, Foreign Minister, uh, they are participating also. I see my uh, colleague, uh, the Minister of Defense, and he met three times with uh, his colleagues, so I cannot agree with you that there is a reluctance from Georgian side of, of uh, uh, having close and cl uh, contacts and close ties with our Ukrainian colleagues. Thank you. Um, Mr. Siarto. Well, thank you for the uh, question and raising this issue. Uh, we are a na direct neighbor uh, to Ukraine. And uh, we are absolutely interested in a stable and democratic and strong Ukraine as a neighboring country. We have 150,000 Hungarians living in uh, Ukraine. And I regrettably, I have to tell you that uh, their, their rights, their minority rights were uh, seriously violated under the regime of uh, President Poroshenko. With passing two laws, one on education and one on using minority languages, the uh, access to a 100% um, uh, education on uh, mother tongue has been eliminated and the um, usage of, um, of minority languages in education, in culture and in uh, media is now pretty much challenging. So I think that if a country takes it seriously that uh, would like to go forward um, and go um, and, and progress with integration procedures, then uh, has to uh, respect uh, the uh, bilateral and international obligations, especially when it comes to national minorities. With a new president, we see a new hope. His statements were rather encouraging. So uh, we hope that uh, after the parliament elections in Ukraine, he's going to um, repair uh, this uh, situation and he's going to give back the already um, um, existing rights of the minorities which were taken away. Because there's a very good benchmark, and here I would like to refer to Serbia. 
Serbia gives the most rights to Hungarians among our neighboring countries, among which there are EU member states, but the Serbs give much more rights to the Hungarians than the EU member states as well. So when it comes, to, uh, when it comes to countries to join, then I think this is a uh, benchmark we should follow. Um, the question is, of course, uh, the conjunction, uh, Georgia-Ukraine, this tandem. Um, Mr. Halverson, you indicated you wanted to talk, and from an EEA perspective, of course, this, this is problematic, I assume. Well, the contact with Ukraine is not problematic at all, together with, with, um, with Georgia. Ukraine is, is our closest uh, partner in, in the region by, by far. We work together on, on so many levels when it comes to, to uh, support uh, Ukraine's uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. And I think the success of Ukraine is uh, extremely important for uh, European stability and uh, peace, democracy, the rule of law in, throughout Europe. So we want definitely Ukraine to, to succeed. Uh, just one example I would like to mention when it comes to the cooperation with Ukraine from the Norwegian side is a, a renewed and very sort of very practical dialogue and cooperation when it comes to cooperation with the EU. Uh, this is something we are now also developing together with uh, German, Germany to basically pair uh, relevant uh, sections, uh, public uh, authorities, uh, agencies, down to the individual level uh, in Norway and Ukraine to look at how uh, the Norwegian experience working with the EU is transferable to, to the U Ukraine today. So this is a, a very practical um, example of uh, preparing Ukraine for uh, further uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. Yes, but not necessarily EA membership. Um, I'm filling out the blanks uh, here. In, in view of time, um, I will do a lightning round and collect three uh, further questions. We had one on that side still and two here. Uh, so I will first ask each of you to be brief in your, um, in your questions and then to, uh, we'll return it to the panel. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm the ambassador of Brazil in Tbilisi. In the closing of the last panel, a surprising and improper reference was made to the president of Brazil out of the scope of the panel. I would like to point out that Brazil celebrates free elections each four years in a transparent process above all possibility of fraud or criticism. President Bolsonaro was elected by the free will of the voters who decided he was the best option for the country. Okay, thank I you very much. We, we've taken note of your statement. It is not in relation to the discussion we are having. Um, can I ask this gentleman to ask his question, please? Thank you so much, uh, moderator. My name is uh, Joseph Chilengi. I'm the ambassador of Zambia to Tbilisi, but based in Ankara. Um, first, let me commend the uh, honorable ministers uh, for the statements, inspiring statements that you have made in relation to the topic at hand, uh, in particular in relation to democratization and modernization uh, as uh, an inspiration to, to the EU. Um, but having worked with the, the EU for 15 years on the joint Africa-EU strategy, um, do you think there is still that uh, positive perception about the European Union on their governance values, uh, values on human rights, uh, values uh, on freedom of expression uh, uh, in relation to the various uh, incidences taking place, the right to self-determination, for example, in, in Spain, uh, suppression of uh, uh, freedom of expression in some, some countries we are seeing, uh, do you still believe that there, there is that uh, uh, value for the European Union uh, to provide a framework that uh, uh, harnesses cultural, human rights, and, and governance values other than the monetary benefit that come with it? Thank you Thank very you. much. Yes, uh, the EU's power of attraction. Sir, there in the middle. Thank you very much. Uh, Christophe Fillion, Professor of European Law at the University of Leiden and the University of Oslo. Um, I had a question to the Hungarian uh, Foreign Minister. Uh, 
Minister, you, you've raised a number of interesting and I should say valid questions about the lack of decisiveness of the EU Council of which you are a member. Um, I'm interested in knowing more about the reasons behind the lack of decisiveness of the Council. Why is it that the Council is not more engaged in um, delivering on enlargement promises to the Western Balkans and more engaged in relation to the Eastern Partnership countries? Um, any answers would be, would be quite um, helpful. The other thing is um, your vision of what membership is seems to me in the era of Brexit to point towards alternative to membership as it is sometimes understood. Is this what you are proposing? Thank you very much. And the last question here on the aisle corridor. Thank you. My name is Archil Gegeshidze. Currently, I represent the Georgian think tank, the Levan Mikhailazi Foundation. Previously worked uh, for the government. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, the panel for a very interesting uh, um, observations. Uh, uh, I have uh, two questions and one, uh, um, one opinion. So, uh, when we talk about uh, Georgia's readiness or uh, European Union's readiness to uh, engage in the, uh, Georgia's accession process. Uh, I think uh, all of us would agree on that, that, that neither of us uh, is, is ready for that. But my question would be uh, why, uh, why there is, a, why there is a, it is impossible to delink uh, the membership with promise of the membership which Georgia still awaits from the European Union. As we are here in Batumi, as we are talking about uh, Europeanness of Georgia uh, and the ancient Christian country and European country, so why why uh, why Georgia uh, would not be uh, offered this promise uh, in compliance with Article 49 of the European Treaty? This is a first uh, general question to the panel. Uh, second very question, briefly, yeah. Second question goes to Mr. Fisher. Since, uh, since uh, you have mentioned. Uh, the recent decision of uh, Parliament Assembly of Council of Europe to bring back Russia. Uh, uh, this decision was uh, received Georgia with uh, surprise and anxiety uh, because this sends to Georgia a very bad message that if and when Georgia gets into the same trouble with Russia, then what are we going to expect from our European friends? And my question to you would be, uh, what, what was the argument behind the decision of those who supported Russia's bringing back to uh, Passe? And the third question no, goes I need to I need to stop you there. Um, Mr. Fisher, there was a direct uh, final question here uh, to you. If you could uh, please respond as the first of the panelists and then be brief uh, in your final remarks. One minute each, please. Thank you very much for the direct question, direct reply. I am not the spokesperson of these countries. So uh, they took this decision uh, based on the narrative that uh, the Human Rights Council sh uh, should be, the, 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 the Russian citizens should have access still to a Human uh, Rights Council within the uh, um, Council of Europe. And this access uh, should be more important than taking into consideration all the conditions in which Russia was invited to stay, um, uh, uh, stay outside. Uh, we have nevertheless, to be frank, uh, a Russian constitutional court already decided five, six years ago that they will not pay attention to the decisions uh, uh, took in, in, in the framework of Council of Europe. So this access is already half closed. So this is the issue to be debated, but the, uh, the, the door was open and me personally, I see it as a very serious mistake. Thank you, Mrs. Siarto. Thank you, Professor, for your question. Um, you know, I think the biggest problem uh, there is that there's a big bunch of hypocrisy and political correctness still. And our aim is to leave all these behind, to have a uh, room and space for uh, open 
uh, straightforward and uh, honest uh, decisions. Uh, since uh, we always say the same in front of public and be behind closed doors, I don't know what is the reason for another type of behavior. So when it comes to enlargement, you, you will hear very pathetic statements of our friends in the European Union in favor, and then we go behind closed doors, they, uh, they don't allow to make the decision. So uh, I think we should ask them. What I, I think is that uh, political correctness and hypocrisy uh, should be left behind. Now, when it comes to the, uh, to the uh, membership uh, question, maybe I, I've, I uh, phrase my, uh, my words in a, in a way which could be misunderstood. So um, the, um, there's no alternative for membership. So, I mean, membership is, uh, is one single phenomenon. And we would like to see more and more countries having this membership in the European Union. Now, but, but regarding how the debate will be decided, whether, whether we're going to go towards a United States of Europe or an alliance of uh, strong um, countries, uh, will determine how many competencies you have to, let's say, share uh, with Brussels as a member. What we think is that no further competencies should be shared. So the um, competencies like uh, border protection, uh, making decisions about tax regimes, uh, making decisions about um, uh, energy policy, making decisions decision about economic policy should be left on the member states' uh, uh, competence. So that's how I, I meant that uh, we don't know what's going to be the meaning of the membership, whether more competencies should be given to uh, Brussels, which we don't like, which we reject, or it's going to be an alliance of uh, strong member states. Mr. Halversen, last final remarks? Yes. Yeah. Just a few words. Uh, I think when it comes to the discussion uh, on the future of the uh, Eastern Partnership countries and the relationship to, to Europe. Uh, I think it is open for discussion, whether it should be at a debate on uh, EEA, for example, or on more updated, tailor-made mechanisms and, and membership. I think that is uh, a point that we need to, to uh, look at uh, further going forward. Let me just reiterate from the Norwegian side, we remain strongly committed to our friends and partners in the region, to the Eastern Partnership as such. Uh, we have recently opened our embassy here in, in Tbilisi, uh, so we are now even better placed to partake in the um, developments uh, here in the region and uh, to expand our cooperation even further. So we want to be a constructive and consistent partner for, partners for the countries here going forward, and the Norwegian commitment uh, remains strong. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, well, just a few remarks. I was listening very carefully about uh, different questions and different answers, but what I think it's important to understand is that for the Eastern Partnership, we, or EU, uh, is uh, neglecting the fact that there is a free elephant in the room. And the only elephant on the paper is European Union. So the others, are, you know, USA, China, and, of course, Russia. So, EU should uh, become a real elephant in the room, not in a, on a paper, when it comes to the Eastern Partnership. That is really something that we, looking from outside still of the European Union as a candidate country, uh, we, we can see that. When it comes to the uh, topic of the membership, I think that the key question could be, it's not only life after association, but life after accession, but not only the question for the new member states, but for the old member states. Because all, all the member states have its own benefits from the enlargement process and from the accession. So, for us, it would be, for example, for Serbia, excellent opportunity this Monday and Tuesday, President of France, Macron, will come to Serbia for two days' visit with our President Vucic to, uh, to talk openly about the future of enlargement. And I think it would be useful for President Macron also to hear from candidate country how we see the credibility of the process. So life after association is also a life after accession. It's also a legitimate question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister. Well, um, I, I also would like to you know, thank all panelists uh, for very direct and very fair um, discussion. And uh, 
also uh, uh, express my gratitude to, to P uh, Peter, and uh, I can say that I fully subscribe what you have said about this uh, membership issue. And uh, uh, in fact, that uh, uh, I want to touch the one issue, the differentiation. You have mentioned the more for more principle, which is really relevant in this case because uh, differentiation does not threaten uh, inclusivity and cohesion of this initiative. Um, uh, to the contrary, I believe that danger lies uh, in reducing uh, its ambitions to the lowest com common denominator. Uh, and um, uh, you know that uh, uh, when country like Georgia delivers on its way towards membership, it has to be reciprocated. We've talked today in the morning uh, in our bilateral meeting that uh, uh, according to all recent polls, the number of population supporting Georgia's EU aspiration is very high. Almost 80%, 80 percent, 80 percent support Georgia uh, EU uh, integration. So, but this cannot be considered as granted. If we not deliver, this can be reduced and it will be extremely wrong signal internally and externally. Thank you very much. Well, as the seven uh, blind persons from Indistan, Hindustan, trying to touch, you know, different parts of the elephant in the room, our six on stage and the one collective in the audience have tried to explore the notions of association and integration or membership. And I think we've come to the conclusion that these are malleable concepts uh, where EU membership is agreed um, as an aspiration, but certainly not realistically on the cards, and that perhaps association in one form or another below EA membership, and maybe association into an, an EFTA form might be the next step up for Georgia and other well-prepared Eastern Partnership countries uh, in uh, graduating uh, from their uh, current status uh, under the association agreement. So, on your behalf, I would like to uh, thank all the panelists and yourselves for your uh, interventions. I would like to invite everyone to lunch on the first floor uh, and be back for session three at 2.25 sharp. Thank you very much. <laughs>